So uh, this project uh, has been going on between th since 2014, and this is this webinar is pretty much the final step. Uh, the project is called Pathway to Accountability in the Global Land Rush Lesson from West Africa. This is an initi initiative that took place in Cameroon, Ghana, and Senegal to help rural communities harness the law to have greater control over decisions that affect them. That's a process commonly called um, legal empowerment. The first part of the project was developing a framework for understanding accountability and evaluating opportunities and barriers in the national framework of each country, and that also includes participatory legal assessments. And you can see the outcome of that um, work in the bibliography, which is on the last slide, and we will share the slides after the event. The second part was um, about implementing tailored interventions to improve the accountability of the public authorities responsible for managing land and improving investments in each country, um, which each country having different contexts and the panels will tell us more. Finally, the project teams uh, recently met at the right shop in Cameroon to discuss lessons learned and write them up. Um, a report presents the result of that work, summarizing insights from first-hand experiences, and there is a link um, to uh, that uh, report again on the slides. So the event, um, the project involved three countries, um, Senegal, um, Ghana, and Cameroon. With, we have three panelists uh, with us um, today. Uh, Mamadou Fall from Innovation Environnement Développement en Afrique, who will be discussing the piloting of locally, locally negotiated land charters with grant rules on how local governments should perform their responsibilities promote public participation and report to their constituents, and community parliaments were involved to facilitate the dialogue. Um, and uh, Mamadou will tell you more about this. Uh, in Ghana, Mark Kakraba Ampe from the Land Resources Management Center will discuss supporting consultative communities representing diverse local groups to promote more inclusive decision making. Uh, the project also produced learning materials to help the communities perform their role. And finally, um, Samuel N. Gifu from the Center for Environment and Development will hopefully be discussing if we manage to uh, sort out the connection, selecting and training new law graduates uh, called junior lawyers, seconding them to a local organization and helping them to assist rural, rural uh, people in legal matters. So uh, we've prepared um, three questions, and each panelist will answer them, um, starting with Mamadou, Mark, and Samuel. So uh, and, and, and answering briefly, concisely, Mamadou, if you could tell us um, what was the problem and what you did about it in your uh, in your part of the initiative in Senegal. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Cherry, and. Uh... Welcome to all the participants to be part of this uh, webinar. Uh, thanks also to IIED to give us opportunity to share our experience on this process. And I will try to uh, give you a quick overview of uh, what we are doing in Senegal during the last three years uh, regarding this, this, this project. So uh, regarding the first question, so, as you all know, in Senegal, land is considered as a very important resource. And this consideration is a consequence of the fundamental place that agriculture occupies in the Senegalese economy. Uh, so, the national law, uh, call it the uh, Loire sur le Domaine National, is the main legal reference as far as land is concerned in Senegal. The law was voted in a context market in the rural area by the lethargy of the traditional land system, which only benefits a minority of individuals, especially the big land owner, call it Laman in Senegal. The national uh, land domain cover more than 19 land in Senegal. And in principle, some important land is under, under, under it. When, when we talk about Loire sur le Domaine National, they are classified into four areas urban area, 
local area, pioneer area, and classified area. And this process, this project, uh, aim to, to, to have interest in the local area, local area. With the local land law, uh, management of land falls within the competence of the state and rural council on the basis of equity and profitability. Uh, indeed, with decentralization since 1972, uh, state established the local governance has an important organ for land allocation and revocation. But in accordance with law, the decision of rural council are enforceable only after being approved by administration authority. As for the condition of land allocation, there are two main points. The first one is the possibility to use land uh, by inhabitant locality. And the second one is land is allocated to individual who could provide proof that you can exploit all this. Unfortunately, implementation of land law is far from being perfect more than 50 years after its promulgation. In addition, uh, during the last 10, 10 years, the surge of large-scale land acquisition interests have been increasing. Unfortunately, <laughs> rather than improving land exploitation, decision-making around allocation creates several conflicts. This has precipitated a rise of human rights violation and environment degradation. Most important land allocations are frequently done without knowledge or concerns of community. And they are enabled to all governance to account for the negative impact they suffer. In these issues, we noted a lack of mechanism to ensure transparency, accountability, and equity in the decision-making process. And this situation undermines governance of land. And it is in this context that the project was implemented in order to develop mechanisms to strengthen accountability and empower affected communities to challenge implemented investment process. And for Senegal, we develop a local land charter, as Cherry uh, remind us, in two areas, uh, Dodel and Merina Dakar, and we work with local paralegal. And we, I will have opportunity to, to come back on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mamadou, and also for keeping to the um, three minutes. So we will now uh, move to Mark. Uh, Mark, again, same question to you. What was the problem? Uh, what did you do about it? Uh, thank you, Thierry, and good morning to all uh, participants. And also let me thank IED for this opportunity to share um, our experiences on this project. First of all, the common problem of large scale land acquisition for agricultural investments is a problem that is faced in Ghana. And so this project sought to understand what the fallouts are, so, and also to provide some measures that would ensure that these fallouts are adequately addressed. Now, through our engagement with three communities where large-scale land acquisitions have taken place and investments, some investments are already on the ground, we identified that there is lack of transparency and inclusion of all stakeholders in the land dealings. And that resulted in situations where indigents lose their lands and get no compensation at all, where benefits are distributed but are only for the benefit of the rich and powerful members of the community, and where investors act with impunity, violating the rights of individuals. We also realize that these occurrences resulted from lack of capacity on the part of the communities to be able to, first of all, appreciate the processes that they have to go through when granting land for large-scale investments. Uh, issues such as 
assessment of their community's land needs uh, presently and also in the future to ensure that where lands are being given out, the land needs of communities are uh, taken care of. Uh, we also realize that the communities also lack capacity to be able to assess what is the fair value of the land that they are giving out and so therefore to be able to negotiate for compensation uh, or payment that reflects the size and the uh, value of the land that they are giving out. And they also lack the capacity to appreciate who and who must be involved uh, because their interests would be affected when the lands are given out. And there was also lack of understanding of leasing processes uh, pre prescribed by the state laws and standards that must be uh, uh, ensured when leases are being prepared. And so working with the communities, we first of all looked at establishing what we call the Community Land Management Committees, which are uh, committees involving a large a range of stakeholders uh, in the community who previously wouldn't have been part of land decision taking processes at all. We also developed guidelines for granting uh, land leases that ensure that communities are able to assess the land needs, uh, engage with investors appropriately to ensure that negotiations result in fair terms and conditions for all. And then we also use these uh, tools, that is the uh, guidelines for granting lands and the checklist for ensuring that. Right, we seem to have lost Mark. Do you want to um, deal with the second question, which is the steps you followed and what did you achieve? So, um, what we, the steps we followed, that we first of all tried to carry out extensive sensitization and awareness creation within the project community, uh, touching on the ongoing large land acquisition, what benefits they stand to bring, and also the problems that if care is not taken could uh, uh, bring to communities. And um, through such processes, we are able to uh, get the communities to come along. We appreciated the issues we were uh, raising with them. And through that process, we worked with the communities to establish the land management committees. Now, these land management committees are not intended to replace the existing uh, tradition, uh, uh, role of the traditional authorities because in Ghana, lands are about 8% of the lands are vested in traditional authorities, and uh, these authorities have their structures. But um, at the community level, you don't have representation uh, of the various uh, groups and people who have interest in the lands when decisions are being taken. And so the project sought to expand the range of people who would have to have their voices heard when it comes to decision taking on land. And, so, and also we ensured that membership included migrant farmers, women groups, uh, youth, and even religious bodies as and where the, uh, the communities themselves thought that it was prudent to include such interest groups. Now, having established the committees, we also um, try to work on the gaps in terms of uh, capacity to uh, engage in land dealings, uh, which led to the development of what we call the guidelines to improve accountable land governance in the community. And the guidelines include, first of all, uh, what processes do we have to follow through when investors have approached us uh, to grant them land for agricultural investment. And okay. what are the things that we need to look out for when we are negotiating the terms? And if we have to 
document the transaction, what are the key features of the lease that is uh, prescribed by law. Having developed the, these tools for capacity building, we also carried out the needs assessment of the various uh, land management committee uh, because of the dynamics, uh, the land tenure dynamics are different in the various, the three uh, different project sites. And so we needed to understand what the peculiar uh, capacity gaps were in the various communities. And based on that, we developed a training a package and carried out uh, training to build their capacity to be able to use the tools when engaging uh, with investors. Uh, so these are the processes that we follow through. And let me say that we were successful in doing that and uh, based on the results that we saw in terms of the ability of the communities to sometimes renegotiate some of the terms that they previously uh, have agreed with the investor. And in some cases, uh, the community were able to engage an investor who obtained land in their community through the government and ordinarily wouldn't have held themselves accountable in any way to the community, but they were able to sit down with the, uh, the investor to negotiate for um, the investor to agree to provide some support uh, to the community uh, on an annual basis, and these are some of the things that we were able to achieve under uh, the project. Thank you, Mark. So, back online now. Um, so, hopefully, um, Samar can address the first two questions. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the process is not as successful. Samar, can you can you hear us? And can you hear you? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to well start by. Also, thank you, you for being here. And very quickly, going through the first question, what was the problem? Uh, we started in Cameroon working with junior lawyers. And the main reason was that we realized that there was an increase in, in investments, uh, land-based investment, land and resource-based investment. Uh, we had already a lot of logging operations going in in Cameroon for many years now, at least 20 years. Uh, and uh, we started experiencing a uh, lot of demand for mining activities and for infrastructure building. And all this affects land and natural resources. But if you put logging, mining, infrastructure, protected areas all together, the, the major consequence that you have is la increased land scarcity. Uh, a lot of restrictions for communities in access to land and natural resources, and the possible conflict uh, between communities and the state, between communities and investors. So this was the context that we had. In 2012, approximately one-fourth of the country, no, one-fifth of the country, 20% of the country, was allocated as mining concessions. And this is huge, because it was done only in four to five years. In addition to that, access to justice was an issue. In court, the, the judges are not trained to address issues related to investment, foreign investment, or issues related to community rights. They are not used to that. This is not part of the curriculum in the law school and in the training schools for the, the judges, the magistrates. Uh, generally, the policies in the country are very much in favor of investments. They are all in favor of trying to attract the investors uh, almost at all cost. And at the local level, people who are fighting for their rights are not always aware of the, the content of the law. They don't know all the rights that they have that are recognized and protected by the law, and they don't know how to use the law. So if you put all this together and you add the fact that we have a bunch of students going out of the law school who will be uh, jobless, they have some legal knowledge, very good legal background sometimes, uh, but there's not enough job for them in the capital city. Um, at the same time, 
there are a lot of people at the local level who are desperately looking for legal knowledge, seeking legal support. So our opinion was that there is a possibility of bringing these two segments of the society together, bringing the students, the, law, the, the student graduated in law, to bring them to the local level where they could provide some support, but also learn and gain experience that will be useful in the future for their own personal career. And um, this was our question, how to bring local knowledge, loc legal knowledge at the local level? How to make sure that those who go at the le local level with legal background have an incentive for doing so? How to make sure that we have a process that will be mutually beneficial for both the communities and the local NGOs and the lawyer? Uh, so this was our question. What we did was to try to start using these uh, junior lawyers on first bringing, we had a selection process. It was quite a long selection process with uh, approximately 250 original applications with 10 finally selected at the end of uh, a process through which we had interviews, uh, training, and further selection by the trainers and by the trainees themselves. We had 10 people at the end. They were trained in things that they don't often learn at the law school. This is everything having to do with uh, rural law land law, indigenous people's law, issues related to investment and things like that. And also some few things that they used to learn at school, but we, we did it with, we did the training with a different perspective. This is uh, environmental law, land law, for example, these type of things. At the end of the day, they were posted in communities, in local NGOs, working with CED, uh, we already knew the local NGOs, we are also already knew the issues on which they were working, we knew the communities that uh, were affected or that were, who, who were fighting for, for their rights here and there. So they were sent, transferred to those NGOs, and the purpose was that they provide support, and at the same time they increase their knowledge on local issues. They receive the support from a uh, more senior lawyer, from the team in CED, but also from other experts, non-legal experts from the team in CED, providing support at the local level to the junior lawyer, to the local NGO, and to the communities. Uh, what we also did was to make sure that they have a rotation, so you don't stick on the same location forever. You start there, you provide some support, you learn, and then you can move. And from time to time, all the lawyers, the junior lawyers, will come together to share experiences, to share knowledge, and to so that they can learn from each other on all the, the, the various experiences that they, they, they have been having here and there. Uh, I don't know if I have to go to the second question or if I, I can st stop here. If, if you want, if, if you would mind, very, very quickly, because we're already um, over the time, so just in couple of questions. Bear in mind, we have time afterwards to um, expand on, you know, ask more detailed questions. So just very quickly. Yeah. Okay, very quickly. What we did, what we, the second question is, what steps we follow, and I already said part of it, but what we achieved, uh, I will very quickly quote three achievements. And to me, the first achievement is uh, with the lawyers themselves. I think that they gain a lot of confidence by knowing the difference between what they learn at school and what they learn through this process. They also uh, gain a lot of uh, political knowledge that has nothing to do with what they, they learn at school. They, they, they have a totally different social perspective. They are much more open to issues around uh, injustices and things like that. They want to do something to fix the world. They want to solve the problems. And I think this is a major achievement because this is something that you can learn at school. You can always receive skills, but you will not receive uh, the attitude that is needed to get involved into this type of work at school. So what I saw in some of them is that they have the right attitude now 
at least for the type of work that we do, and they are ready to uh, spend more time, invest their energy into trying to solve the, the, the problems that they, that they have seen, that they are learning about. The second, uh, the, the second achievement is that in some places and some specific issues, the junior lawyer was really important in trying to address some issues and to work towards finding a solution. So they were able to be efficient in addressing an issue, in using the law as a tool to protect community rights. And I think this is a good achievement. And uh, the third uh, type of achievement is most, has much more to do with the type of questions that came from the lawyers. We are in a type of iterative process. We design the, the process, the content, but we also rely a lot on feedback from the lawyers to know what we have to improve on. And if we have the next batch of junior lawyers, there are some few things that we will be doing differently on the grounds of what the junior lawyers have brought uh, in terms of feedback to us. Thank you. Mamadou will now ask the, uh, answer the second question and we move on to the third question. Okay. Uh, I miss I miss your last sentence, but uh, so I will try to to sum up the two questions and to share uh, some lesson and also to try to share with you also some uh, achievement during the process. So the first thing that I would like to to share is uh, in the both two sides we have already drawn up the land charter and uh, with the process. A local platform of negotiation and discussion was set up for all the local community. Uh, and now the community has the willingness to, part, to take part of all the decision making regarding land issues. And mainly uh, local governors now take more attention to the decision when they take decision on land because they know that for each decision, they have to be uh, they have to be account during an annual meeting, which bring all the community uh, to ask questions about how they manage their land. And for this issue, I think uh, it is a relevant achievement during this, this, this process. So, uh, established land charter is very complex process with necessity to be very patient and to take into account the diversity of stakeholders. It is not a single method or process for developed adoption. It is not a, a straight way to, to achieve this, 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 uh, this result and it is very sensitive. The process could be generally quite long and take many months, sometimes many years. They demand a lot of methodological slowness. For example, involvement of, of, of representatives of all groups of stakeholders. It is really critical to ensure that the involvement of all stakeholders and avoid to take decisions which will be incompatible with the legal system. During all the process, paralegals who facilitate the process for training, for uh, give opportunity to all the stakeholders to be, take part of the process and to conduct consultation process. It could be very difficult sometimes if we underestimate power of relationship and diversity of, of interest. Because, yes, in, in general, we, you could have some, some question about uh, the, representative, the representative issues, who is actually legitimate, has a negotiation store for the local community. Do some stakeholders really defend the interests of those they pretend to, to represent? So we have uh, several questions uh, like that who bring us to know that we have to take account all the all the their point and to start and the most important thing is to start to improve our understanding and ability to ask 
to the right question and take effective action on land matter in all the country. So quickly, that is what I would like to share about so the second question and the, the, the third question. So in terms of achievement and also in terms of, uh, of learning during the, the protest. Thank you. Right. In terms of lessons that we learned and, and which also will include the tips that we can offer to others who would be engaging in, in similar processes in the future. Uh, what we learned is that discussions centering on land are very sensitive issues and usually communities are very skeptical uh, about the intentions of of, of projects. Uh, some may t take it to be that you want to understand what they have so that government could tax them or introduce some forms of laws and other legislation that would be to their disadvantage and they are therefore are unwilling to open up. And so the lesson here is that if you continuously engage uh, in a transparent manner, uh, you are able to build trust and therefore get communities to engage fully in the project activities. Uh, the second lesson that we also learned is that when communities are given the right uh, direction and, and, and guidelines and uh, uh, help to appreciate uh, land issues in terms of uh, uh, land needs assessments, uh, land value assessment and appreciation and uh, what the law and policies regarding land within their environment uh, say, then they are able to work things out in a more inclusive manner uh, and that help to promote accountability. They are also able therefore to uh, demand their rights. For example, in one of the project communities that we work, the community was able to get the investor to come up with a community, uh, uh, um, sign out an agreement, community uh, development agreement uh, with, the, with the people, uh, which makes the investor contribute $25,000 annually to the, invest, uh, to the community for the life of their investment, which is about 50 years. And because uh, they also were given training to understand what benefit sharing arrangements must uh, be so that uh, all interest groups are very well taken care of, they have also agreed to use part of the $25,000 support to establish a scholarship scheme that is supposed to benefit a wide range of people uh, for education purposes. Uh, in another community, they were also able to uh, engage the investor to renegotiate the terms of the agreement and get the investor to shift the boundary about one kilometer away from the community because they now realize that the land that they initially granted uh, did not take into consideration the future expansion of the settlement. Uh, the other lesson that we have also learned is that when communities own the processes of the project, they get much very well committed to that and they are therefore able to stand for their rights when they realize the benefit that the project uh, uh, would bring to them. And even in the phase of, of, of uh, the powerful uh, they are able to stand for their rights. And I'll give an example where uh, a member of parliament who initially uh, did not participate in the project and when the land management committee was formed, he perceived it to be an arrangement to undermine his political authority, sought to dissolve the committee. The whole community stood up and insisted that the committee must remain and realizing that he is unable to defeat them, he now selected his own representative to be on the committee uh, so that the committee, the committee will work for the entire community. And that, we think that community ownership of projects is very key for project success.
thank you very much, uh, Mark. And if Tamer would like to enter the third question, if you still here, Tamer. Okay. Uh, yeah, the third question, the lessons learned. Uh, I would quickly like to go through uh, five lessons that I want to share. The first lesson is that it's really important to provide a good supervision to the junior lawyers. They, uh, they have good legal skills often, but they are not very familiar with the context and with the issues. And uh, to, to avoid uh, mistakes that they could make, uh, it's really important to provide a good supervision, both on legal and technical issues, non-legal issues. The, the second point is that we really have to carefully select the battles that we want to fight. There are some issues on which uh, they could be useful, but they will not see, they are not likely to see the, the end of the, their effort by the end of the project. Or there are other issues which will really be, I think, too, too, too difficult for them. It's, uh, so we, we don't want to get them involved into battles that are too high for them. Uh, the risk is that they can get discouraged at some stage. And the third, le the third lesson is very much related to that. Uh, their engagement is for a short term. It's like two years. And uh, they will stay in a given location for six months only. So in six months' time, even if the issue is not very big, they are not likely to see to have uh, the final success. They, they are not likely to see the end of the process. So we have to carefully define steps uh, according to the time frame that they are spending on the project in a specific location, so that by the end of their term in that place, they could have achieved something and they can go out with something positive, even if it's not yet the end of the, the problem in the area they could see the step that they have achieved and they could be proud of that. The fourth lesson is that we have to always ins insist on learning. Uh, learning is key here because we, we also keep in mind that the purpose is to share legal knowledge, the purpose is to use the law to protect community rights. So at the local level, they should share their knowledge, they should spend some time making sure that people have access to the laws and regulations, that they have answers to some of their legal questions before the lawyers go out. And people mean uh, staff of the local NGOs, but also community members. We should insist on learning by the junior lawyers, and part of this learning will come from their interaction with actors at the local level, but also with uh, the supervisors from CED, and finally between the, 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 the junior lawyers themselves. When they meet, part of the reasons why they meet is to share experience, to learn from each other. And the last point is to keep in mind that one of the, the reasons why the junior lawyers uh, spend time doing this is also because they expect to learn, they expect to have, uh, after they have completed the their term in the project, they expect to have better skills that they can sell into bracket and get a better job. So we have to provide exposure to the junior lawyer. An exposure could be in terms of participation in uh, meetings, events, seminars where they can, people can see what type of skills they have, but also know that they exist. Uh, exposure could mean contributing in publications, Exposure could mean sitting next to the communities in discussions so that other actors can see them and see that well, they have good skills and they could be potential workers for their organizations. Thank you. Out of time, so very, very quickly to mention the fact that, um, as usual, the, um, there will be a blog after uh, which will be a summary of the points that were discussed uh, and that would include the slides and the slides have a link to all those publications we mentioned including the one uh, that um, Lorenzo just, just mentioned now and also um, I will send a survey 
to all participants for you to complete, just to ask give you feedback on the